The following is a recording of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu. Well, it's good to be with y'all. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 11. Now, the Bible is the infallible and errant inspired Word of God, our only rule of faith and practice. Amen? So this is a very familiar passage. I want to read just verse 1, but we will make comment on all the way through verse 13. Jesus giving us instruction about prayer. Hear the Word of God. Luke 11, verse 1. It happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after He had finished, one of His disciples said to Him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. Let's pray. Father, again, in the name of Jesus, we ask for the Holy Spirit to be upon us. We know that we can do nothing apart from you. We are not interested in a man's opinions about news, sports, or weather. We're not interested in anyone's opinions in the context of the church on sociology or psychology or any of these things. Father, what we want to do is we want to hear your word. We want to see Jesus high and lifted up. And Lord, we do ask for the Holy Spirit to come on the preacher and every one of us here in this session, but also in the rest of the day as we fast and as we pray for revival. So hear our prayer. We make it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Jesus, as you well know, told his disciples, going into the world, disciple, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, y'all know that there's only one verb in that passage. That verb is, is disciple, not make disciples, disciple. Then there's three participles that tell us how we go about doing it. As you're going, as you're baptizing, which connotes evangelism, and then teaching them to observe. So you're building them up in the faith. That's the command that we have from Jesus. And again, in Luke chapter 24, after his resurrection, prior to his ascension, he says, now, I want you to preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins to all the nations beginning right here in Jerusalem, but remain in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. And again, in Acts chapter 1, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, my martyrs in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. I'm going to lay down a principle here that I know you know, but I want to emphasize it. This task of discipling the nations is impossible. Paul tells us that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. He says that to the Ephesians. He says to the Romans, there are none who understand, there are none who seek for God. All have turned aside. Together they've all become useless. There's none righteous. There's not even one. You know that. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so they might not see the light of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. The work to which you've been called, those of you who are being trained for the gospel ministry, is an impossible task. Now, there are plenty of people in the evangelical world who are trying to get it done in their own strength. I go back to Norman Vincent Peale, the Marble Collegiate Church in New York City, the power of positive thinking. And then his disciple, Robert Schuller, the Crystal Cathedral. Then Peter Wagner and... Uh, Donald McGavran and others. And then, maybe, I don't know, 25 years ago, Peter Drucker, you know, the management guru, began to notice, he, he is a 
at best a follower of Kierkegaard and he is a self-confessed unbeliever. He's dead now. But he admired the church and he saw potential in the church. And so he had a, a disciple, as it were, a na man named Bob Buford, who made his money in the cable television industry out in Texas, who was a, a professed believer. And his business was growing, so he began to use some of Drucker's management techniques in his Christian business. And then he got the idea, wait a second. What if I, what if I sponsored what I'm going to call a leadership network? What if I began to get young, really gifted pastors together and began to teach them Drucker's management theory in order to build the church? So he got Rick Warren together. He got Bill Hybels. He got some PCA guys, too. Andy Stanley and others. And this launched the megachurch movement. Now, many of these guys have, well, I'm just going to state the obvious, they've gone off the deep end. Perry Noble right down the road here in um, Anderson, South Carolina. He was preaching to 32,000 people, 11 different sites. His net worth is $40 million. He's probably 45 years old. But he divorced his wife, and his church finally dismissed him because of family trouble. I'm, I, I, I'm, I imagine it's over his divorce, and also because he had a drinking problem. And I could go on and on and on. So that obviously doesn't work. We know it doesn't work. We, we knew that from the get-go because it's not biblical, right? We understand that. But, there's, but people are trying to reach this wicked and perverse generation and they're doing all they think they can in order to make it happen. They're totally misguided. We get it. But on the other hand, there are many in the Reformed world who believe the Bible, who are deeply committed to our confessional standards, who seem to believe that as long as we preach the Word, as long as we have good Presbyterian polity, as long as we subscribe to the Westminster Confession of Faith, I guess that's good enough. I guess it'll work. How's that working? Not too good. We're Trinitarian. We believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But I'm going to suggest to you that a lot of us are missing the third person of the Godhead in a practical sense. Now, let's look at the text because Jesus teaches us about prayer. Obviously, His disciples have been with Him for a while and they notice that He prays very differently than the rabbis pray. Theirs was more of a formal, rigid, six or seven times a day type prayer life but there, there didn't seem to be a whole lot of vitality or life in their prayer ministry. And yet they saw Jesus praying all night. They saw Him praying with an intimacy with His Father. And they observed that and they said, Now Jesus, would you teach us to pray like John's taught His disciples to pray? Jesus says, Okay, here's the instruction. Here's how you pray. And He gives them the Lord's Prayer. He gives them the six petitions of the Lord's Prayer. No doubt you start, uh, studied the larger catechism, which is absolutely brilliant on these six petitions of the Lord's Prayer. Brilliant. But then He goes further. Then He is going to teach them about the necessity of prevailing in prayer, of persistence in prayer. He goes, now, that's how you pray, the six petitions. Now, but what you've got to realize, you've got to persist. So he says, let me tell you a story. So there's a man who's in bed. It's late at night. One of his friends is visiting from a long way away and was the custom of the day to show hospitality. He needs to give this man something to eat. There's not a McDonald's on the side of the road where he can find something to eat. So he is waiting for something to eat, but he doesn't have any food. So what does he do? He goes next door to his neighbor, knocks on the door. <coughs> I have a visitor. Do you have some bread I can borrow? Go away. It's midnight. I'm in bed. My children are in bed. Go away. The man 
persists. The man keeps knocking on the door, as you know the story. And Jesus says, the man gets up out of bed and gives his friend bread, not because he's a friend, but because he persists in prayer, because he is, as it were, a pain in the neck. All right, here's the bread. Go away so I can go back to sleep. We're to persist in prayer. If we don't get an answer the first time we pray, we keep praying. When you've got lost family members who have wandered away from the faith, maybe they were baptized, maybe they were catechized, maybe they were Christian schooled, homeschooled, whatever, and they've walked away from the faith and they're breaking your heart or your parents' hearts, then what should you do? You should pray until you get an answer. Pray without ceasing. And what is that answer? You pray until they're born again or you pray until they die. And if they're born again, then you pray they grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. So he's teaching about persisting in prayer. Then he's going to teach them about confidence in praying. And this is utterly astonishing. You know this very well. Uh, in verse 9, he says, So I say to you, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened to you. Have you ever really stopped to consider actually what Jesus is saying? Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened to you. In Matthew 21, he says, Whatever you ask in prayer believing, you shall receive. Now we know there's conditions for prayer. We know that we've got to pray in the name of Jesus. We've got to pray the Word of God. We've got to pray in the Spirit. There's a lot of things that go along with this. But if we're doing these things, we're praying according to the will of God. What's His will? His Word. If we're praying the Word of God, if we're praying in faith, we should ask and we should believe that we're going to receive. We should seek and we should believe that we're going to find. We should knock and we should believe the door will be open to us. <coughs> Now, so Jesus is teaching about persistency in praying. He's talking about confidence in praying. And then, finally, he's talking about an expectancy in praying. He'll say, now suppose this. And what he's doing here, as you well know, he's using a wonderful rhetorical device. He's teaching them to argue from the lesser up to the greater. He says, now suppose this, that a child comes to his father and says, would you give me some bread? Or in this context, in Luke's gospel, it's, would you give me a fish? And if he asks for a fish, you'll not give him a snake, will he? If he asks for a fish, you'll not give him a, a, a scorpion. How's it go? What does it say? Scorpion? Yeah, excuse me. If he asks for an egg, you'll not give him a scorpion. <coughs> if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Now in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, how much more will the Father give good things to those who ask Him? But in Luke's Gospel, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Now listen, when, when Pentecost came, the Holy Spirit came, this is a once for all deal, not to be repeated, but it's also not abrogated. It's still in existence. And when you were born again, I believe you were baptized with the Holy Spirit. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit. And yet at the same time, we're told to be being filled with the Holy Spirit. We're told not to grieve the Holy Spirit. We're not to quench the Holy Spirit. We're not to resist the Holy Spirit. And so though you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you as a believer, you can also have the presence of and the power and the unction of the Holy Spirit coming down upon you. That's what Lloyd-Jones was after throughout his ministry. He was looking for the anointing, the unction from on high to fall on the preaching of the Word of God. And my dear friends, that I suggest is largely missing in our world. It's largely missing in the Reformed Church. Now, I was talking to Dr. Curto earlier. He preached last, a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, 
at our Samuel Davies Conference on Evangelism. Now, I had heard he was a good preacher, but I'd never heard him, and he was. And I just told him, and I'll tell you the same thing. He's one of the best preachers I've heard. And it's not just the content, which was great. It's not just the delivery, which was great, but it was the passion. I came up to grab him and shake his hand when he finished. He was soaking wet from, from, from just the, the sheer action of preaching. My, my dear friends, that's what we got to have in our day. What Peter Drucker and Bob Buford and that crowd are doing is dead. It's lifeless. It's not real. This has been an abject disaster in American evangelicalism. Forty years ago, I think I knew what an evangelical was. I don't know what one is today. It's astonishing. And now, as you well know, we've got homosexuality coming into the PCA and other denominations. You say, how can this be? Because we're not preaching, (coughs) excuse me, we're not preaching with unction from on high. Now listen, I suggest there's a difference between preaching and teaching. Now, preaching ought to have content, of course, But something's happening differently in preaching. Teaching is a dissemination of information in the seminary class, and that's very, very important. But when you're preaching, it's something different. It's kind of like this. If I'm a medical doctor, let's say I'm an oncology surgeon, and I'm also a lecturer at the local medical college, and three days a week from 8 to 9.30, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday morning, I'm lecturing at the medical college. And then I get in my car, I drive a couple of miles to my office. And about 10 o'clock, I'm going to start seeing patients. And so I'm spending a few minutes looking at the details of what I'm going to be speaking about. Now, when I'm in the lecture hall, I'm going into great detail. I'm being very technical because these students who are going to be doctors need to have that background of information. They need to have that deeply stored in their mind and later on in their residencies when they practice medicine, they've got to know this. So I drill down deeply with great technical medical terminology, no doubt about it. But when I get back to my office and the first person coming to me, I suspected that he did in fact have a brain tumor because of my experience, but I read the oncology report. Yes, in fact, he does. So now my job is he comes in and sits down in my office is now my job is to deliver to him the message. He doesn't necessarily want to hear all the technological jargon. He doesn't need to know all of the words. They're important in their context. But in this context, here's what he wants to know. What is my problem and what is the solution? What are you going to do about it? That's what he wants to know. And that's the difference. And when you preach, you're preaching for a verdict. I like to say that the preacher wears two hats. First of all, he wears a hat as a covenant prosecutor. He's to use the law of God, the three uses of the law. He's to use the law for the unbeliever to drive him to faith. He's to use the law for the civil use to to warn legislators and those in the civil magistrate, if they continue down this road, they're under the judgment of God as uh, on our nation. They're responsible. And then, of course, the third use of the law for the believer, showing him his sin that he might repent and come back to Jesus, right? So a prosecuting attorney, if I'm a prosecutor and you've been indicted for embezzling funds from your major corporation, then my job as the prosecutor, is to put you away for 30 years. That's my job. So what am I going to do? I'm going to garner all the evidence I can. I'm going to garner all the witnesses I can. And I'm after one thing. I'm after a verdict. I want a conviction. That's what I want. I want you, thank you. I want a conviction of guilt for this crime. And that's what the preacher's got to do. It's not merely information. Too many Reformed and PCA pastors are simply giving information from the pulpit. There's a place for that. But not when you're preaching. You're preaching for conviction. You're preaching. What are you going to do with what you've heard? 
Now, after the preacher, you, has used your hat as a prosecuting attorney, then you take that one off and you put on a new hat. Now you put on the hat of a defense attorney. And now you begin to lift up Jesus. And you begin to talk about what a wonderful Savior He is. And though you were formerly alienated, hostile in mind, and engaged in evil deeds, yet He reconciled you to Himself through Christ, through His body of death, in order that He might make you before Him holy, blameless, and beyond reproach. You talk about this great lover of our souls. You talk about the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, the one who loves us and releases us from our sins by His blood. You keep telling people that... I am the bread of life. I am the, uh, I am the, the light of God, a light of heaven. I am the good shepherd. I am the open door. I am the way, the truth, and life. I am the resurrection life. I am the vine. You're the branches. You just keep lifting him up as this great, great, glorious, majestic Savior of sinners. That's what you're to do. But I don't care how well trained you are. I don't care how many sermons you've preached. I don't care how gifted you are as a communicator. Those are all things God uses. Without the anointing, you've got nothing. Nice message. People may be entertained, but no power. No power. Listen, I never thought I'd see the day when my denomination is allowing homosexual pastors in the denomination. I never thought I'd see that. I look at our inner cities, it's hopeless. I look without Christ. I look at many of the young people in the universities today, it's hopeless without, without revival. I look at the LBGTQ community, they've won the day. It, I mean, politicians don't even touch that one anymore. It, it's, it's over. They've won the day. The only thing standing against complete <laughs> submission of our culture to that Wicked lifestyle is a few evangelical denominations here and there, and we're, and we're waffling. So what are, you, what, what are we going to do to change things? Are we going to go the way of Peter Drucker and Bob Buford and Rick Warren and those guys? Is that, is that going to work? No, it's not going to work. But on the other hand, just because we're faithful to the scriptures of the Westminster Confession, that's not enough either. My dear men, you must do what Jesus is saying here. You must ask for the Holy Spirit. Now, I read a book a couple of years ago by Al Martin on preaching in the Spirit. It's just a little bitty small book. Wonderful. And he asked the question, okay, what exactly is happening when the anointing of the Spirit falls on the preacher in the very act of preaching? He said, I'm not talking about praying in your devotional time. I'm not talking about the Spirit giving you insight as you prepare your sermons. He said, that's good, that's important. But what I'm talking about is the very moment you stand before a congregation or out of the streets preaching, what happens when the Holy Spirit attends that preaching? This is beautiful. He says, well, there's at least three things that happen. First of all, the Holy Spirit enlightens your mind. Now, I guarantee you, Dr. Curto, And others who've preached a lot have had this happen. You've prepared your sermon. You know where you're going. You know the cross-references you're going to use. You know the exegesis of the passage. You know the applications you want to make. You've got in your mind some illustrations you want to use. And while you're preaching, all of a sudden, the Spirit gives you something else. He enlightens your mind. He gives you a new insight on the fly you weren't thinking about. Am I right? Have you had that happen? It's amazing. In fact... When you're driving home after church, your wife says, that was amazing insight. Where'd you get that? Well, I guess God gave it to me because I didn't have it earlier. It's astonishing. The Holy Spirit will do that. That's not to mitigate the necessity of preparation, of course. I'm just saying there are times that He gives you insight and application and illustration And he will apply the scripture to somebody in the congregation who's hurting in a particular way. And you didn't even know it. It's amazing what he can do. Not only that, while you're preaching, he can enlarge your heart and give you a deeper, more profound love 
and understanding of the people before you. If you're like me, when I would pastor church, as I'm preaching a particular sermon and I know where the text is going and I know the application, I start thinking about people in the congregation who, to, to whom that could minister. Somebody who's depressed or whatever. Yeah, so, I'm, okay, that can maybe help. And I don't call the person out, of course, but I'm saying I know what that, that could help that person. But what about when you're preaching and God enlarges your heart, He enlightens your mind and enlarges your heart, and you begin to make an application to someone you didn't even know would fit into their, 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 their thinking or their particular situation. It's amazing what He can do. So He can enlighten your mind, He can enlarge your heart, but as Al Martin says, but that's good. But what he's also got to be able to do is he's got to be able to loosen your tongue because if you've got a large torrent of words and thoughts coming out, but there's nowhere to go, you're just stumbling around. You've got, you got to get it out. So he gives you divine eloquence. He enlightens your mind. He enlarges your heart. And he gives you felicity of speech. He loosens your tongue. Now let me ask you a question. Do you regularly ask for the Holy Spirit? Now, I know you believe in the Holy Spirit, of course, but do you consciously, volitionally, prior to preaching, ask for the Spirit? What do I mean? Well, before I preach, wherever I am, I'll say this, borrowing from Charles Spurgeon, I believe in the Holy Ghost. I believe in the Holy Ghost. I believe in the Holy Ghost. And Lord, I call upon you in a time of trouble, believing that you'll deliver me in order that I might glorify you. Open my mouth, Lord, and fill it with your word. Enlighten my mind. Enlarge my heart. Loosen my tongue. And help me to proclaim your excellencies. And I say, Holy Spirit, I'm asking for your power. Right now, I'm asking for you to come on me and on the congregation. Give me your anointing. I like to say, in the context of doing revival prayer weekends at churches, that the Pentecostals have kind of hijacked that term, the anointing. I'm taking it back. It's a biblical concept. So I ask for the anointing. I ask for the unction of the Spirit. I ask for God to give me a divine eloquence. When I first entered the ministry, there was a, I was planting a church in the Virginia area, and there was a man in, the, in our presbytery who was a stutterer. And you would hear him try to speak at presbytery meetings, and it was, it was embarrassing. I felt so bad for the guy. It, it, it was really very, very sad. Well, I noticed one day on the docket that he was to preach the sermon at the Presbytery. And I thought, oh, oh my, this is going to be difficult. I feel, bad, I feel bad for the guy. He stood up to preach. He did not stutter one time. And I've always thought that's an amazing manifestation of the Spirit loosening the man's tongue to preach. And what are we to preach? Well, you know what we're to preach. We're to preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block. To the Greeks, foolishness. But to us are being saved, Christ, the wisdom of God and the power of God. That's what the world needs. They need to hear Christ crucified preached, proclaimed to the world. And we could go on and on with all of the various important nuances and details of his death on the cross. But we could think of his redeeming work and his expiating work and his propitiating work and his reconciling work. But what I want us to focus on for a moment is that amazing passage in Romans 3. Again, we don't have time to develop it. It's, a, it's, a, it's the Mount Everest of all gospel texts that where he says, in summary, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift, by His grace, through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, whom God displayed publicly as what? 
a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness to the forbearance of God. He passed over the sins previously committed. But the demonstration, I say at this time, that he is just and justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. My dear friends, the propitiating death of Jesus. When he was on the cross, you remember he says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's crying out for fellowship. He's crying out for mercy. After all, he's been in a perfect triune relationship with the Father and the Spirit for all eternity. A perfect love in the Godhead. But now, he's cut off. He's separated from his Father. And why is he cut off? Well, we know 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Psalm 5 says that God hates all who do iniquity. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. Now, when I'm preaching in the open air, I'll very often say, let me give you some good news. And I'll quote John 3, 16, God so loved the world. And then I'll go on for that for a little while. And I'll say, but now i got to give you the other side of it too. The Bible also says that God hates iniquity, that God abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. What? That's right. On the one hand, he loves the sinner, but on the other hand, he hates the sinner. How can that be? Well, you see... We can't do that because we have indwelling sin. We're incapable of it, but he's absolutely, perfectly holy. There's no taint of sin in him whatsoever. So yes, he can love with a pure love and he can hate with a pure hatred. And the question we have to understand is this. Do you understand that you are under the wrath of God and that you, if you die right now without Jesus Christ, you will go to hell? But what we love to tell people is, but Jesus died in our behalf. He died in our place. He took the wrath of God upon him for us. He took your fornication, your idolatry, your homosexuality, your drunkenness, your thievery, whatever it was. He took it all upon himself and he became sin for you and for me. That's the message we love to proclaim. And when Jesus was asking for mercy, when he was asking for comfort, there was no answer whatsoever. He was cut off. That's the wrath of God coming down upon him in order that that justice might be, uh, might be satisfied. Well, that's what we want to preach. Now, again, you can have it all down theologically. But... If you do not have the anointing, it won't do anything. We're preaching for a verdict. I promise you, most PCA pastors I know of are not really expecting anything to happen when they preach. We should expect conversions. We should expect transformation. You should preach with one thing in mind. Whatever that one part of that text is, you drill it down. You drill it home. The only way that will happen, as Calvin points out, is through the Holy Spirit addressing the heart. One thing to address the mind, but to address the heart, you've got to have the Spirit. So, in closing, do you ask for the Spirit? And those of you who are not pastoring, the, 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 the lady here with us, do you pray for your pastor to have the Holy Spirit? We should do that. When you're sitting in the congregation, you're not preaching. You should pray, Holy Spirit, come upon the preacher and every one of us. Have your way with us. Deal with us today. Expect something to happen. Preach Christ crucified. Ask, begin to ask regularly for the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Right, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for each person here. And Lord, we ask that you would work in us even today, that we would ask for the Holy Spirit when we preach, and that you would visit us. And we believe that if we ask in faith, if we're repenting of our sins, if we're walking in holiness, then we have every reason to believe that the Spirit will come upon us. That is our great need. So Father, hear our prayer. Would you bless our time here today? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.
Why don't we take about a five-minute break, and then we'll start praying, okay? Thank you for tuning in to this production of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, please visit gpts.edu.